Okay, on to our keynote speakers. I'm so excited. Interim CEO of Puffin Drinkware, Scott Allen, and Tyrone Hazen, founder of Puffin Drinkware. Tyrone Hazen moved to Ben specifically for the access and community resources available here. Since successfully closing a round of Series A funding last December, Puffin Drinkware has brought former Hydroflask CEO Scott Allen onto the team as interim CEO. Tonight they will share what has happened with Puffin since its start in 2019. Welcome back to the pub stage, Scott and Tyrone. Get on up here, you two. Good evening. How are you? I'm good. How are you? All right. I'm excited. It's been a minute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if people are curious, like, how does a founder and a CEO work together? We're going to find out tonight. Yeah, because... <laughs> Basically, the guidelines from Edco is like, yeah, you guys just get up there and basically don't suck. Was the, so, so we have a goal, right? We have a goal. You, you want to tell them what we had in mind to kind of make it interesting here? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, at Scott's recommendation, uh, I'll give you guys a little bit of background about myself personally and the, the business itself. And then we've each prepared a handful of questions for one another. So we'll just do a casual kind of communication up here and then hopefully we'll parlay that right into a conversation and answering questions from the audience. So. Yeah, and these are questions that we are actually curious. I don't know the answer. And he, he saw the questions like, oh, I want to ask you that. And we haven't shared the answer. So we're going to kind of reveal some of this uh, in real time for you tonight. Uh, so yeah, Tyrone Hazen, uh, as, as was mentioned, I've moved up here in uh, about nine years ago. Uh, and I actually already knew about Edco before coming this way. Um, I've my background, I, I guess you would say, is in real estate, but um, I, I've always had some like yearning to find, to take my ideas and see them manifest. And um, I've failed numerous times along the path, but each one of those got me one step farther and one step farther. And um, you'll hear a bit more about the, the current success that, that uh, we've landed on. Um, and so the, the backstory with, with Puffin is that I was over... Uh, this would have been like 2016. I was over at a friend's barbecue and we we're having beers and he's, he comes around with a box and he's just tossing out your standard koozies. And as luck would have it, the one he tossed to me was kind of made of the remnants of an old sleeping bag. And it, I put it on my, on my puffin, or excuse me, I put it on my beer and I, the feeling of it reminded me of my sleeping bag from you know circa 1986 or something. Had a different feel to it. And I had a bottle in it. And immediately I had this idea of, oh man, how cool. What if, I, what if I made a mini sleeping bag for my beer, right? We're in Bend, we do beer and we do the outdoors. Um, so I thought, oh, this is great. And because I've always had this yearning to be an entrepreneur, um, this would be a great opportunity to go figure out how to do this. So I didn't actually think that I would launch a business out of this, certainly not something that has taken on the life that Puffin has taken. I thought, well, this will be an opportunity for me to figure out the entire process of ideation through you know, design concept, get it out in the market, learn marketing. And so I was going to build a system that I could plug my future ideas into. And so I'd given myself a goal of uh, 13 weeks from concept through Kickstarter. And so we're like six or seven years later, haven't done a Kickstarter yet, and the business is still up and running. So that's kind of, thank you. That's, that's a bit of the backstory, um, and, and I know some of the questions from Scott, so I'll save a little bit of the meat there. But um, we started the company in 2018. We were doing a test market, and luckily, again, here in Bend, uh, we had the opportunity to just go share this idea with so many different potential channels and find out where it worked and, and what made sense and what didn't make sense. And so... Um, over just through trials and tribulations and a lot of networking and events like this and leveraging the network and the support in Central Oregon, um, we've turned it into what it is today. We've got 16 employees plus a number of full-time contractors and um, sky's the limit. We still have a lot of opportunity ahead of us. Okay. Yeah, well done. And I, I think John said it well earlier, just like entrepreneurs, God bless them, right? They create companies, they create, they take concepts into market uh, and for those of us that come in a little later and, and, and work with these companies like we wouldn't have something to do if it wasn't for great entrepreneurs so I'm, I'm curious uh, Tyrone somewhere along the way as you're getting traction you decided oh I could use some co-founders uh, so like what was it that did that 
and then uh, quickly, Byron and Christina Linton, raise your hands back there. These are the co-founders of Puffin. Welcome. <laughs> how? So the second part of that question is, how the heck did you sell them on coming in and being your co-founders? <laughs> uh, yeah, great question. Okay. So I knew immediately that I wanted a co-founder. As I mentioned a minute ago, I've had a number of uh, attempts at startup and fail, fail, fail. And so through that, you realize just how challenging it is, especially this day and age with omni-channel presence and um, just the expectations around a brand. It is, there's so much to know and so much effort that goes into it. And I didn't have a bunch of money to throw at this and, and time to dedicate. I had a job when I started this. So I knew very quickly that I wanted co-founders, or at least a co-founder. And so I approached someone else first. I had somebody with one of these previous, uh, previous businesses that had done some design work. And so I approached him, and he was on board for about three days. And then I think his wife was like, what are you doing with that guy again? You, no deal. So uh, I, I reached out, I started thinking again, and uh, I had an acquaintance friend uh, in Byron, Byron Linton, and I reached out and said, hey, I've got an idea. Can we chat on this? And the reason I was interested in Byron uh, was because he came from the ad specialty world. He uh, ran a, a website called underabuck.com. And I thought that that's where we'd have to go with, with this product. I thought, well, no one's going to pay you know, $15 for a koozie. Um, so I thought we we're going to have to sell this at a wholesale price to somebody who's then going to give it away as a promotional item or something along those lines. So I chatted with Byron, and you'll have to ask him why he signed up for it, but he did. And uh, he thought, yeah, you know, I'm looking for an opportunity to try something different, and this sounds fun. And I tell you, I got so much more than I bargained for out of Byron coming on board. Um, not only did he know that ad specialty world, which we're, you know, we've dabbled in a little bit, but... He is an absolute student of business and entrepreneurship. And he, you know, he's one of those guys you get in his car and he's got an audio tape playing at 3X and you can't hear the words, but he's just absorbing all of this, you know, this startup discussion. And so he came it's like on... Like the Matrix, huh? Like the Matrix. Absolutely. I didn't know what was happening, but he's getting it. So he, he was so helpful in helping provide some guidance and some rails around my crazy ideas and building systems to make sure that we were able to implement some of the ideas that we had. And then for, a, for a quite some time, had uh, you know, we worked really well together in providing, kind of coming up with the vision and where we were going with this. Once we started to see some, some traction and we realized that these sell really well in person and we couldn't quite crack the code on direct-to-consumer through the website, we, uh, we knew we needed to scale somehow, and neither one of us had the ability to just go hit the road. But his sister was in town, and so we were like, hey, Christina, what are you up to? And she loved what we were up to and, and said, yeah, okay, I'd love to give this a shot. She was looking at getting into business, uh, like B2B sales, and so she needed that checkbox that said that she had done that before. So we loaded her up in a car and a bunch of tiny sleeping bags and sent her to the coast, <laughs> And she crushed it. She got like a 97% open rate. She had people literally chasing her down that missed her sales call. So chat with her. Um, the, the fun thing I'd like to share with about Christina is that she, she was, is like the heart of the organization. And when we were negotiating, I was trying to figure out how to pay her. And we didn't have any money to speak of. So we knew we had to like pull her in as a co-founder and give her some equity. And throughout the negotiation process, every time I'd pitch something, she'd go, oh, let me think about it. I was like, shoot, I thought I had her. And she would come back and we'd talk again. And one time she finally stopped me because she saw my pattern of trying to just get her more money. She said, you know what, Tyrone, you could pay me a million dollars a year and I wouldn't do this job unless we're doing something good. And I said, perfect. You figure out what we're going to do that's good. I'll figure out the way to make it be a lift for the business, and we'll carry this thing on. And so since then, we have uh, implemented a, or a component of the business called Good Together, where we do local, national, um, kind of give back um, component, uh, or like philanthropic um, give back things to the world, and so that we're trying to do the best that we can while we're doing well ourselves. So uh, a quick round of applause from, from my co-founder. Yeah, well please. done. So, so that's how we got started. And at that same time, Scott, you were manning the helm at Hydro Flask and were wrapping up your career there. And then you got the sweet taste of retirement and turned down a number of opportunities to come work with us. Yet here you are as our CEO. 
So my question to you is, what was it at the end of 2022 that changed your mind and had you come join us on this journey? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what was it? it no, uh, yeah, I never, when I retired from Hydroflask in uh, 2020, I thought I'd travel. And it was like February of 2020, so I had all these plans, and then right, we all quarantined at home, my poor wife, Anne, who's here. I mean, she had to deal with me stopping work and then being home and not doing all the things I wanted to do. So I, don't know, I picked up a lot of boards, uh, and it was, I really enjoyed kind of giving back and working with entrepreneurs in that capacity. But I, I think after three years of Zoom board calls, like I, maybe the timing was like, I, I kind of miss working with people. I kind of miss being part of something. And I, I knew I didn't want to sign up for, for a long time to do that, but uh, I think the timing was good. The, the investors I, I know, uh, one was a, the investor that hired me into Hydroflask and learned to work together uh, through that process. And then I think the other thing was just like, I had been approached by companies like, hey, you know, like we're this great company and you know, just come to Kansas. It'll be awesome, you'll love it. And like, <laughs> no, I, I'm here in Central Oregon. I, I enjoy being here in Central Oregon. So the fact it was here. And then I think the last thing was like, it is kind of cool. You know, and it's the, the, the people and the stoke and just the, the possibility for what this brand can be with, with funding, with backing, and, and with some time and opportunity uh, was intriguing. Yeah, certainly. Uh, and, and you landed the funding. I mean, that was kind of a big, a big thing. I've, I've been at companies that was like, okay, welcome board. Hey, we're out of cash. You know, it's like, hey, that was really great. Uh, you know, thanks for the memories kind of thing. And so, and I think it kind of gets to the question I want to ask you. Because obviously, when you started the, the business, the business just turned four kind of officially from a, a products in the market. And we all know what happened since like 2019 to now. And so to start something as an entrepreneur and bootstrap it during a pandemic and during the follow on like global supply chain nightmare, right? I mean, what were the sources of capital that you were able to access just being a scrappy entrepreneur? And then later, what was it like to land? private equity funding, I mean, from some top shelf investors, I, you, you did that. Yeah, it was super easy. Super, it was smooth sailing. <laughs> Shoot, so, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, funding uh, was a challenge. I mean, I think that the, if I brought anything to the team, it was creativity in, in funding, and some would say accounting. Um, <laughs> So I, if you know, if I walk, was walking by you and I heard change in your pocket, I was going to ask you if we could talk because I, I needed. It really was like there was it, to any entrepreneurs in the audience that are looking to fund their business. That's the thing is you just have to keep going. You turn over a rock, and if that person doesn't have an, anything for you, you ask them who they know and who you should go talk to. So early on, um, you know, Byron and I put in a couple of thousand dollars a piece just to get an initial um, initial product runs. And then it was a lot of credit card debt, and we had uh, we we landed this uh, thing called a working capital terms loan through uh, American Express. We were able to leverage that, and then it started to get bigger than you know banks or credit card companies wanted to give us without you know much of a proven track record because we were just growing so fast so quickly. Um, the the first investor that we had was actually we we, we got some debt financing from um, who he's now up in Seattle, but was a, a local member of our community. And um, we approached him for like as the pandemic was starting to enter the United States, and um, negotiate a deal there. And then you know through constant communication and letting him know what we were up to, we tapped him again, and then we tapped him again. And eventually he was like, "Hey, this is really great, and I love what you guys are up to. I don't want to be a bank. I'd really love to be involved." But we just didn't feel like he was the right fit from an equity perspective. He wasn't the smart money we were looking for. Super, super smart guy, but he just his skill set wasn't where we were looking. Um, so we had to get creative again, and, and through uh, the network here, a, a friend of mine put me in touch with an or, a group called Settle. It was Settle.co at the time. I think they now have the Settle.com domain name. Um, and they were some fancy fintech startup out of San Francisco that had just gotten funded, I don't know, $300 million in debt financing to go take risks, and they did. I had a quick conversation. They were like, cool, here's a million bucks. And then later on, I was like, hey, I need more. And they were like, cool, here's another 1.1. And then when I couldn't pay that back, I was like, hey, what should we do? Because <laughs> it was really challenging. You know, as you mentioned, the supply chain meltdown and stuff. So um, 
that was when, you know, with, with, we were a fast growth company. And so uh, with the, the, the other founders and I, we were like, well, we don't, we don't want to go do equity before we have to. We want to grow as, as much as we can on debt so that we keep enough of this for ourselves because you hear so many stories about founders ending up with 2% of a company. Um, so eventually it got to the point where we weren't going to be able to find financing. We had to start conversations with, um, with people that were going to come in and, and purchase a portion of the company and invest in us and along with us. And that's when the conversation started. Actually, Scott, it was you that introduced me, us to Village Family Capital. Uh, Sean's in the room or somewhere here. Sean's here. Thank you, Sean. Uh, and that was interesting, a totally different experience for me because I always thought it was one of those like, oh, man, you do the elevator pitch and then they cut you a check at the car. It's not like that. <laughs> it was a year plus between introduction to when we actually got, got the funding lined up. Um, and then another one of our, of our advisors had introduced us to Jim. And so we connected Jim and Village Family, and through the, a, a diligence process, went through the went through the the whole thing, and landed. Uh, we funded on the last day of last year, and um, yeah. So it's just it's a grind. You just keep going, and you don't take no for an answer uh, on the funding side of things. Um, so for for us, this is a, a great segue actually. Um, with the funding, we got Scott. Because I thought we were going to get Scott and then the funding, and it turns out worked the other way around. And um, now you've been on for six months. How has this experience with Puffin in the early days compared to your experience with Hydroflask in the early days? Yeah, there's there's some similarities in that the the company kind of was it's emerging from these different stages, right? So one is just that survival stage that Tyrone kind of highlighted some of that. It's just like survive. Your goal is to survive. So it's just like be scrappy, get product out there, keep growing, figure out how to fund it. Just keep extending the runway. Once you're like funded, you can take a break. It doesn't feel like we've taken a break, but it, you, you do, you begin to transition and say, okay, it's a different time and stage for the company. So we need to be more strategic. We need to think about what we're trying to do. We need to kind of, change how we do things more to scale, right? So there's very similar in that uh, regard. I think the other thing is just this concept of like, there's red ocean opportunities, there's, you know, blue ocean. Red ocean is just like, we're gonna compete in a really crowded competitive marketplace. There's blood in the water. We're just gonna go fight and go get what we need to. Blue ocean is kind of what Hydroflash is. Like we have this insulated bottle. There's not a lot of people, there's bottle, but there's not this. If we can create a category and lead a category, we can get out in front and we can take advantage of a head start, this is clearly similar to that. Like you're inventing something that, that really isn't a koozie. When people see it, there's no way they think that that's what it is. So that's similar. I think the differences are, it's just a different time. You know, we've gone through as a society a, a pandemic. I think everyone's had to sit there and say, what's important in my life? How does work fit into my life? What are the things I need to do? What was nice about working from home? What was nice, you know, and those kind of things. So. I think as employers, we're trying to f figure that out. Like, how do we create community? How do we connect with our people? How do we have those moments where people, you know, feel like a team, but then also have their lives, have things go on, have the need to focus and work at home and so forth. So that's just so different. I mean, we always went to an office. We're always together. We're always it's just the, it's like unsaid. Today, it's different. You know, how do we navigate that? I think that's uh, that, that's a big difference. Yeah. Uh, so. Okay, so that, this is the question of be careful what you wish for, Tyrone, because like you wanted uh, funding and you wanted a CEO. And uh, late last year you got both, you know, like, hey, how has it played out versus how you hoped it would play out? And this is one I really don't know the answer. So we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna find out together on this one. Here we go. Oh yeah, great. So. I I don't know that I had any expectations. You know, like you said, we were in survival mode, and so I didn't have the opportunity, the, the luxury to think forward more than a, a few days because we were running out of money before through a few days had passed had we not pulled this thing off. So um, I don't know that I had any expectations, but I can tell you my experience. Um, and I think one of the things that I was reluctant about initially was... We, we knew when we were negotiating with you that this was going to be an interim thing. And I thought, you know, there's a lot of disruption when you take somebody, you bring somebody in and they're, they're on top. They're, they now control the reins. And my concern there was that we were going to do that as you came in 
already knowing that we're going to have to do it again in six or seven months. And so I spoke with the, the investors of the board about this, spoke with my co-founders, spoke with you about this. And um, I, I have a lot of trust in the, the knowledge base and the, the, the smart money that we brought on board. And what Jim told me when I asked the question or, or posed the concern was, you, if, you, if you have Scott for six months, you'll be 18 months ahead of where you would have been anyway. And I thought, you know, that makes sense. I can get on board with that. I should have asked for triple the pay, right? <laughs> I mean, this is like, now I hear this. So, so yeah, I, I guess for me, you know, like I said, I, I, I was really beat up. Um, I, I had a, a really rough, I mean, the, the COVID came in and I was stuck in a closet for two years just trying to make sure that we could make payroll. And so I was like, take the wheel. You know, when, when somebody came on board, and I didn't quite know what it was going to be like to be a, a founder who, you know, I was kind of running our accounting finance stuff. We also brought in a CFO. So I was like, all right, where, is, where do I settle now? And how, what does this look like to be like, well, this is my company, our company. This is my brand. But somebody else is running it. And that, I, I never really quite figured that out. And so it's actually been a, a luxury for me to have the experience of an interim CEO. And as, as sad as I am, that you know your your tenure with us is coming to an end. There's a blessing in the sense that I got the opportunity to kind of experience this as a trial run, and so now as we go into the the, the final stages of of working with Scott as a CEO and bringing someone new in, I know what it is that I want to be doing for the company and where I can be of value without stepping on the CEO's toes and being an, an augment to the rest of the team, even though I don't have uh, you know, a traditional role that I'm, I'm running marketing or he's running sales. Um, I'm, I'm a founder and I'm the founder uh, of Puffin and I will step into the new relationship with our new CEO um, with a lot, of, uh, a lot of more confidence in how I can be of value to the company and to the, and to the brand and to my team. Um, so I'm, I'm really grateful for that, and that, that experience has provided me with so much learning. And I mean, I've never even worked at a company that makes a product, so like we were, I was just totally in over my head. I didn't even know what a CEO did, so I've now got to see from the inside. Like, <laughs> and I definitely was not a CEO before. Like, I thought it was cool to like say, "Oh, I'm the president, I'm the CEO of Puffin." I didn't know what the hell I was doing. So now that I've got to see it, I, I know what it, where it was that I, um, where, you know, where I can grow and, and where I want to grow and where I don't. I don't want to be a CEO. I want to be the founder and I want to go build culture and I want to go, um, you know, be a figurehead and go kind of guide the brand where I want to see it go and where I think it will, will live best. So I, I'm super excited and I'm appreciative of the opportunity, so thank you. Yeah, there, there was a moment where we wrote his like success profile or job description, and I read it. I'm like, I trade you. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's pretty cool. It really is. So, uh, and it's important for a brand to have that. It's super important. Uh, so yeah, so I'm I'm super excited, and that brings me to the the question for you, which is now that you're kind of wrapping things up here at Puffin, and we're going to go on and do amazing things with you, cheering from the sidelines. What is it that excites you about Puffin's future? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's definitely being here, like in Central Oregon, is it's just such a great place to build a company like this uh, because we tend to love our products, evangelize our products, you know, buy the products, gift them, at, you know. So there's the community support that is is so important uh, to the brand. So I think that's one. Two is just the people. I really see. Uh, you know, hardworking, passionate leadership team, yourself included, that's just stoked to go get it done. You know, it was not easy to go through survival stage. There's hard decisions that had to be made. It just it was not easy to do what they've done, and it was exhausting. I, I think the first time we all got together, I, I, the mental image for me, and I found a good picture of it and shared it with the team, is like you watch the Winter Olympics, and they do that, like, distance Nordic racing, and they all get to the finish line, and what do they do? They just go kaboom, and they're just done. They're done, and that was basically the team I inherited. I'm like, hey, guys, you guys ready to go? And they're all just kunk, you know. Uh, and he still had to wrap up the finance. He, he's still on the track doing laps. You know, everyone else is like kunk, but he had to kind of do three more laps before he could do that. Uh, so I just see that team coming together and really kind of energized, and that's the beginning of, like, ambition and achievement and, you know, the exciting things. And this, they've attracted just amazing Board. I mean, besides the financial investors, a woman, Amy Friedlander, she was chief business officer at Liquid Death. 
You talk about just like epic marketing and content and brand building. She was in the war room when this brand was kind of hitting stride. So the, the energy she brings and the permission for us to think big as a, as a brand, for you guys to think big as a brand. And then I think just the possibilities are, are just crazy endless. I mean, broader, bigger than what Hydrofuss had in that if you think about this expression and how, what is apparel? What are the things we wear? It's like, what do we wear when we're snowboarding? What do we wear if we're skating? What do we wear if we're mountain biking? What do we wear if we were a fan of this team? What do we wear when we go out to a nice dinner? What do we wear when we just hang with our friends? It just the expression of drinkware, all the places it can go, all the things that you guys can do. Yeah, you better do it. Yeah, you know, like you better, <laughs> don't let me down, Tyrone. Don't let me down. I, no, I'm super excited to see how the story plays out. It's never just straight shot. It's up and down, it's hard and all that. But I, I feel like the team has some energy and confidence and a little bit more swagger to go get it done. I'm, I'm super proud of uh, being part of the journey for, for a brief moment in time and excited to see what you guys go do. That's all we had. You ready for me? <clears throat> How about a little bit of love for Scott and Tyrone? I just, I want to say I'm just so proud of you. This is the third time that we've been on a pub talk stage. You're the keynote now. You and get a I, mug. You get a mug. <laughs> We're going to have to make a custom size puffin for it because it's pretty big. Um, but I, my impression is, and you referenced this a bit in your talk, but my impression is that you really have had this like, kind of mind-blowing trial by fire education throughout this process, and you've been very open and receptive, and it's really molded you and grown you as a person who is a leader of a brand. And I just wonder if you might elaborate a little bit on what this has been like for you personally. Yeah, wow. Um... Yeah, I mean, growth, right? Like, there's so many areas of growth that get um, that are are <laughs> gently provided as you're <laughs> trying to go through these these situations. And you, yeah, you learn a lot about yourself. You learn a lot about your limitations and whether they're real or not, and whether you can find a way to get around or through them. Um, I think that my creative muscles have expanded because. You know, the, I, I liken being an entrepreneur to kind of hacking your way through a jungle. And yeah, you can use some of the tools that other people have, have used, but by definition, you're doing something, you're doing it in some way that hasn't been done before. So you can, you know, you can, sometimes the path is really clear, and then other times you're hacking away for, you know, hours on end and you feel like you're getting nowhere. And so just recognizing that if you, you do that over and over and over and you look back, you go, oh, hell, I, I've actually covered some ground. And so that alone has helped with other, you know, challenges in life. And, um, you know, when Scott came on, we had, like he said, we had to make some really difficult decisions. And those were things that I've learned how did, I don't know that I could do them yet, but I've learned how to see those and how to be objective about what needs to be done. And, you know, you learn that people land on their feet. You learn that um, you know sometimes they're they're you're going to hurt feelings and it's going to be okay and that people recognize that. So yeah, a, t a ton of personal growth for me and, and mostly just recognizing how how much room there is yet to go, mm. um, which is cool because that's exciting. It's part of the journey. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's great. I'm really proud of you. I know I said it. like it's really it's really great. It's cool. Um, okay, questions from the audience for these two. Yes. Yeah. Have you ever measured the efficacy of how cold it would be? Ooh, okay. This is a fun question. So she said there's no doubt it's drinkware, but have you ever measured the efficacy, like how cold it keeps your beer? We have. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because, of course, people are going to be like, well, yeah, but does it work? And, um, and so we don't market it that way because, again, that's not why people are buying it. People are buying for the identity, and they're like, oh, that's me, or that's my cousin, or that's my uncle. Um, but we perform really, really well, um, surprisingly well. I think that our results, we did a, like, you know, we had six different things out, and we did, you know, as scientific as we could in our little building. Um, and we found that we were, it was somewhere in the like 90% range as effective as, um, you know, like, a and your insulated, um, uh, vacuum, ins like a vacuum insulated colster type of thing. Yeah. Like really, really functional. Yeah. We, we just don't sell it on that because that's boring. We want to do, you know, we want to do the fun stuff. And more stylish, right? Uh, that's yeah, the thing. Uh, yeah, yeah. 
Okay, yes. Such a fun question. Have you looked at doing branding collabs with Code Epoxy, North Face, et cetera? Yeah, and, and so there's certainly kind of a growing list of brands we'd love to kind of engage with or partner with. It, it's, it's interesting, we're really just trying to get our house in order, get good at getting products to market when we say we're gonna do it and take care of our current customers. But yeah, our ambitions are to do really fun, cool collabs. And I, I think as people get exposed to the brand, like their appetite to do that. Uh, goes up pretty far. And we just got back, Tyrone was there with uh, one of our employees at the licensing expo, and it's just like, people get it. You know, it's kind of like, we got to do one of these with you guys. And even like, our board members are just like, come on, you guys, South Park Kenny hoodie. Where is it? Where is it? You know everyone wants that. It's just like, there really are these kind of fun things. So we, we definitely see that as part of the growth strategy and a fun thing that brands could, could do with us. There is one... Uh, slipper brand that approached us and they were going to do a takedown of one of our products for holiday and it looks we weren't sure it was like okay it's kind of not who it's slipper coming to us but man they did a great job we're really excited to see that launch uh this year so you can have cozy footwear and cozy puffin during the holiday so yeah stay tuned for more on that that's cute i like that a lot that's great that's one of like super exciting that's one of the things that in that excites me the most is the opportunities to to work with other brands to work with licensing collabs things like that it's, i think that's so fun and that's going to really like take us to the next level great question thank you and it seems like it's like so much bigger than what you would initially really envisioned when you were first like when you first came like look i got this you know little thingy and then but now it's like it's legitimized mm -hmm. yeah it's so cool good job yeah it's been fun okay yes National Hockey League. When are we going to see some National Hockey League? Come on, go Kraken. What's up, Tyrone? Where are the Kraken puffins? Uh, yeah, so licensing, like, I, like you mentioned, we were at the licensing expo just last, last week, and the, the whole world of licensing is there, which is big, but at the same time, it all fits in one building, and not a single no from the 11 meetings that we had. Everybody is like, yeah, what? It, but then there's, you know, it costs a lot of money. There's a risk involved. And then we've got a go-to-market calendar that's, you know, 18 months long. Um, but it's a, it's a great question. In fact, we had a, a board meeting today. And after we presented our plan for the next coming years with licensing, um, one of the board members was like, what would it take to move that future column to, like, two years forward? And we all just laughed, right? Like, it, it, we don't know how to go about doing that. But... Yeah, sports licensing, huge opportunity. You can imagine tailgating in you know the SEC football things like that. So that's something that we're really excited about. We've always had it. In fact, when when Byron was kind of heading brand, that was one of his goals. Was like licensing is going to open up doors for us. So as fast as we can without taking unnecessary risks. And we, and we do have some customers now. For some reason, we've cornered the market of Pennsylvania hockey because uh, <laughs> if you go to see the Flyers in the future or the Penguins now, like they have puffin hoodies with their logo on it. So we were getting kind of interest from clubs that are either the licensors in the arenas will buy it, put it in the merch area and sell. So we're starting to see that happen. Our desire to do those licenses and take it bigger is certainly on the on the timeline too, or on the on the roadmap. Any other questions? Yes. Wow, you get some big thinkers in the crowd tonight. So you've got national brands. Are you thinking global? We're in Canada, too. <laughs> We're international. Does that count? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah, you know, our goal, myself and the co-founders, has always been to run this up, like to have the full story arc of entrepreneurship, which includes an exit. And so something like international, there's one, there's a couple of, challenges with it, which is, um, you know, we have a really unique drinking culture and we have, uh, you know, we, we drink our beer cold, whereas if you go to England, they, they don't do that. And they drink out of pints and not out of bottles and cans. So we're, it's, it's not as open as you might imagine. Not, that's not at all to say that there isn't massive opportunity. Um, but that's probably like, we want to perfect what we do here and then like leave some meat on the bone for bigger companies that have that international reach. So that's currently the, the plan is to um, kind of leave, leave the international markets available and open. Um, but, you know, 
time will tell. Maybe we decide to go there. But there's just so much opportunity right here still. So yeah, we're staying focused on on North America. Yes. <laughs> we got a good idea, Perry, in the audience. <laughs> Right. I was thinking this too. He's, he's pointing out that there's a, some kind of connection with rugged threads here. Some kind of, I mean, I know the sewers are like, oh, those are very tiny garments. I don't. If, yeah, if your uh, zipper starts to come undone, yeah. I mean, it's warranted, but if you want, yeah, I, there could be some. something. Something. Right. Fix right. the puffin. I'm sure they can. They fix some of my stuff. I, I know they're very good. They do great work. I, it's, I it is, a, it them, is so. like a fun through line for tonight's uh, presenters. Okay, any other? Yes. What about a pint glass puffer? We got a slow sipper. Sometimes her beer is warm. By the time she gets to the bottom of the pint, would you consider doing a pint glass puffin? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's so many opportunities. We have a really tiny product team. Right now it's one, uh, <laughs> plus a licensing person that's in, in that realm. Um, and, and there are so many opportunities to just, you know, stay focused on what we're doing. But it has absolutely been broached. In fact, one of the, the best pieces of user-generated content that we were able to leverage was um, someone using our little parkas with the, the faux fur. And she had stuffed just a Starbucks cup in it. And it didn't, it was ill-fitting. It didn't matter. It had like six million views. But we thought, oh man, like imagine if it actually fit. Like how, yeah. how like people would those be flying off the shelves? So um, yeah, if it's, if, if it's a drink, then maybe there's some wear for it, right? Yeah. If it's a drink, we'll put an outfit on it. Yes. <laughs> Have you had any issues so far with protecting your IV? IP. Yeah, no, and um, so Jeez. We, we have just, <laughs> yeah, IP enforcement. Yeah, so we have, uh, we do have intellectual property. We do have design patents uh, as well as other kind of trademarks and, and, and some patents, utility patents. But the primary thing is when people knock us off, it's pretty easy to enforce. And, and in the online marketplaces, this is one thing that's evolved since I was in Hydroflask, it's really easy because you can assert your IP and they'll seize the funds of whoever's infringing. Now they may have sold two of the things that infringe on us, they may have sold one billion tires, who knows. All those funds get seized until this gets settled and they tend to settle because they want their funds and they tend to back off. So it's great how that's evolved. Uh, over time, we're now starting to see in some stores knockoffs of our products there. So we're able to kind of go after the manufacturers and so forth. It's, you know, for Hydroflask that happened too, it's kind of a milestone. It's like, okay, we've gotten to the point where people think this is a good enough idea to rip off. Uh, the next probably stage is a real brand comes in to take us on. So how do we get to the point where we're at, where we want to be from a business standpoint to be ready for that, that day? So we, we think that's part of a sense of urgency. Let's go out and get some of this great business so that we're that company and they don't want to mess with us. Sounds good to me. Yeah, it's kind of like the dude, like, this is a Patagonia jacket. This is the Schmatagonia jacket I got on Amazon for $9.99. <laughs> it's a big difference. I imagine it's probably true for you all as well. Okay, one last question. Yes. Hi, sir. I'm Emily Boyd. We've got you to meet you. Oh. All right. This is, this is a really fun question. So she wants to know, when you were first starting out, did you really do the research? Did you find your niche, or did you just go for it and just you're just like, I'm Tyrone, and I'm going to do this thing, and I don't care? What did you do? Yeah, no, I mean, I wouldn't even know how to go about researching something like that, right? So I, I had the idea, and like, like I mentioned, I kind of, I, I didn't think that this was going to become what it was. I mean, this was never the goal. Um, so when I started showing it to people, and they were like, oh my gosh, this is that idea. This is, this is going to go. In fact, the first store we took it to was uh, the Bend store downtown. And this was in September. This is when we were testing, so September of 18. So tourists had left. Holiday shopping hadn't started yet. And um, we're by ourselves in the store with, with the owner, Delia. And she just didn't get it. She was like, ah, I don't know, guys. Maybe, maybe come back closer to the holidays. 
And somebody walked in and heard a bit of our conversation, and they interrupted. And they said, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but is that what I think it is? Can I buy two of those right now? <laughs> and so we backed away, and then, like, she kept calling, and we had to keep replenishing, replenish, replenish. And so literally within a week, she had replenished three times and said, hey, I know you've got limited inventory. Can I buy everything you have left? So once that happened, it was like that, that kind of was the test. It was like we, while we were testing where to go sell these, we realized, like, you just get them in front of people, and they sell. That's awesome. I love that we're ending there because I know it wasn't a plant. I know that was a real person. So how about a round of applause for Scott and Tyrone? And as you know, you, you get a pub talk stein. Scott, I have one for you, but you have one, right? Do you want to do, do, yeah, do take two? You can recycle. No, no, just recycle. You want me to recycle this thing? <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that's an option, Scott, but I'll look into it. I'll yeah. send it to the... the Rugged threads. Okay, um, thank you so much and well done. Thank you.